Uh, welcome to our class tonight. It's uh, Vegetable Gardening and Raised Beds. Um, I'm David Rice with Weaver Basin Water Conservancy District. We have Sheridan Hansen from USU Extension joining tonight, and we appreciate her taking time to, to be able to instruct us tonight. So just a really quick introduction. I wanted to um, just show you something. So I've still got my screen shared up here, and I wanted just to show you, just as a little plug for the messaging that's happening this year, the, the, the governor has declared a drought, you know, and we've we've put out a lot of messaging. Everyone's putting messaging to wait to water. So I just threw this up. This is in my backyard. I have not watered my lawn and it's green. And, you know, there's tulips in the background. There's stuff going. So I just wanted to tell you, you can wait and things are going to be fine. So if if you're panicked, of course, it's starting to dry out. I I. I know I'm gonna need some water on the lawn probably this, uh, by Friday or Saturday, I suspect. Uh, but if you, if you have, if you've waited, good job. If you haven't um, and you're watering just a normal schedule, cut that back a little bit. We're in a drought year, you know, you, your lawn's gonna be fine. It's, it's actually pretty resilient and it, it's gonna do fine. But that's a little side note from the class of vegetables today, but I did just wanna throw that up there and, and let you know that you can do it and things are gonna be fine. So with that, um, just again, some of you have joined before, you welcome you to the class. Uh, Weber Basin Water is a wholesale water provider for Davis, Weber, Morgan and Summit counties. And so we, we work with cities wholesaling drinking water, secondary irrigation water, and, and even dealing with agriculture water on large contracts and so forth. But our mission of course is to provide water supply and, and make sure that supply is adequate to meet the population demand. So the, the reason for these classes is of course, just to help educate you as a, as a user, as a homeowner, help you understand things that go on in a landscape and with vegetable, the vegetable garden is a little outside of that, but even that we're using water, you're, you're growing a crop, that's a great beneficial use of, of water and the resource, but we're doing these to help educate you. The more you know about the landscape and about the garden and how these things work, you'll be a better water manager. You just, you'll just understand and, and be able to manage that better. So I think with that, really quick on the Q&A, if you have questions throughout this, we, we haven't, we set these up to really eliminate a lot of background noise and, and a lot of stuff, chaos going on. And there's some security things our administration wanted. So the, the way to deal with questions for this webinar is please don't use the raise hand button because I can't really call on you and have you speak. It's there and I could get your, get. I mean, it, it draws attention, but I can't really have you speak. So please use the Q&A, little Q&A button on your controls and just type in a question. And then Sheridan will pause periodically, we'll address those questions. If there's some simple things in the background, I will just address those and type in those answers back to you and we'll just move forward. But there's there'll be plenty of time for some questions. Sheridan's great about answering these along the way. And so I think with that, Sheridan, I, I don't have anything more. I'll turn it right over to you. You can share your screen, introduce yourself a little more if you'd like, and, and let's go with it. All right, thank you so much, Dave. So um, like David said, my name is Sheridan Hansen. I'm a horticulture professor um, with Utah State University, and I'm located at the USU Botanical Center, which is in Kaysville. Um, if you have not been to the Botanical Center, I very much invite you to come out. Um, we have 100 acres here. A lot of what we do is based on water management. So we have some great ideas, trees that are drought tolerant, how to flip your park strips and make those drought tolerant, um, how to do your vegetable gardens better. Um, we spent the day today, my master gardeners and I prepping our vegetable gardens to be planted next week. So I'm sunburned and dirty and I am so ready to talk vegetables tonight. So um, like Dave said, put your, your questions in the Q&A and I do like to pause here and there and we will get to all of your questions. So um, that's probably the most important thing is to help you get answers to your questions. So I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna dive into veggies. Oh, hold on. I clicked the wrong button. There we go. Okay, so let's dive into veggies. And we don't have a huge amount of time. Um, this is kind of based on a lecture that I do with our Master Gardener program throughout the state. So I give a lecture like this, but much more in depth um, to our Master Gardeners in every county of the state. 
Um, but so I've just kind of condensed all this information and also done an emphasis on raised beds for you guys tonight. So, um, you know, there may be things that you have questions about that I normally cover. So please make sure that you, you ask those questions. So when we talk about vegetables, um, we kind of need to classify them because it will determine how we plant, how we grow. And, you know, horticulturists, botanists, all of us gardeners, we like to put things into categories. That's just kind of one of the things that we do is we categorize things. So we can look at vegetables a couple of ways. And one way is kind of their life cycle, how quickly they're able to go through a full life cycle and how long they last in the garden. So we can look at things like annuals. These are things that we can plant from seed and they go all the way through the life cycle to setting seed in one year. Um, we have things like beans and radish and corn. These are all annuals. Peas, there's a bunch more, but I just listed a few more or a few examples for you. And then we have what's called biennials. So these guys, instead of completing their life cycle in one year, they complete it in two years. So the first year you'll see leafy green growth that sometimes we refer to as a rosette. And then the second year you'll see a stalk um, shoot up with a flower and then it will produce seeds. So the first year is vegetative growth. The second year is what we call reproductive growth. So these are things like onions and carrots and celery. And if you've ever missed a carrot in your garden and you allowed it to continue to grow the second year, same with onions, you'll see this big stalk with this flower on the top. And that's what's happening. It's completing its life cycle. And then we have perennials. And these guys live indefinitely in the garden. Um, things like asparagus and rhubarb, if we plant them and take really good care of them, they can live a very long life. Some of them can even outlive us. So asparagus, we typically see 30, 40 years if we take really good care of it. And rhubarb, that's a really cool plant that's been around since dinosaurs. We have fossil records of rhubarb. So that's kind of a cool plant that is very long lived. We can also look at vegetables um, as like the, the temperatures that they like. So we can look at their temperature requirements. So um, we have cool season crops. These are crops that you you may have already planted in your garden and that's great. Um, if you missed it this year, some of these can still go in. It's not too late for a few of these, um, but these, these types of crops like growing temperatures between 50 and 75 degrees. And when I say these degrees, it's air temperature or ambient temperature. So that, that air temperature, not the soil temperature. So these are things like peas and onions and beets, all of our salad crops, cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, radishes, kale, carrots. We can still get things like the onions and probably some of the kales and broccoli in now. Um, and same with beets, but some of the things like peas and the, some of the salad crops, it's gonna be too hot too fast for those types of crops. So we missed it on a few, but some of them were still good. And then we have the warm season crops. These are kind of the rock stars of the garden. This is why everyone wants to grow a garden. Um, you know, peas are great, but tomatoes are way better, right? Um, so these guys like temperatures that are a little bit warmer, ambient temperatures or air temperatures around 70 to 90 degrees. They can withstand cool temperatures down to about 50. Below 50, we, see, we start to see damage on these crops. So we have to have nighttime temperatures that are above 50 before we go planting these. So these are things like tomatoes, peppers, corn, potatoes, beans, squash, melons, and cucumbers. And potatoes are in here, but they're kind of an anomaly. The top part of the plant likes warm air temperatures, but the roots like cooler temperatures. So we can plant these ones a little bit early. We usually put them in around April 15th. If you haven't got your potatoes in, not to worry, you can still do it, but they can go in a little bit earlier. So I like to kind of run through on how to kind of choose a garden site, what we call site selection, um, because this is really important. If we don't put our garden in the right spot, we don't have things situated just right, it makes things really difficult for us. So I was a small scale um, urban farmer for quite some time. I ran a two acre vegetable farm in East Layton. We sold at farmers markets and we had what's called community supported agriculture, a CSA is kind of short for that, where you purchase a share of a farm and you get like a basket or a, um, a bag of food every single week from the farm. So um, we ran that and this is our site. And you can kind of see that there is a lot of sunlight. There's not a lot of area that is impeded by shade in the site. So it was a perfect place to grow vegetables. 
Most vegetables need full sun. And by full sun, I mean six to eight hours of sunlight. So we need a good amount of sunlight. Now there are some um, crops that can grow in a little bit less sun situation. So a part sun situation, things like lettuces, spinach, the leafy crops, if it doesn't set a fruit, um, then we can get away with a little bit less sun, but not by much, about four hours is your minimum. We also need to look at the soil. And in this location, we had a sandy loam soil that was really nicely draining. Um, so you need to know a little bit more about your soil. We want the soil to not hold water for too long because waterlogged soils will cause root rot. So if you have a really heavy clay soil, it might be a case for you to put in raised beds, which we're gonna talk a lot about tonight because those drain better. Um, or you may have to add a lot of organic matter and start amending your soil and helping it to drain better. Most of our vegetables root in the top six to eight inches of soil. They don't have really deep roots. And so if we have a raised bed or if we can get the top layer of our soil, that top six to eight inches of our soil really nice and workable, it will help us in the garden. And we want to have a good amount of organic matter. So organic matter is like leaf mulch or um, plant parts that are breaking down in the top of the soil that give us what we call good soil tilt. So it makes the soil light, it makes it fluffy, it helps it hold water in a really good way, helps it hold nutrition and um, is excellent and beneficial. Now in Utah, we really don't have a lot of naturally occurring organic matter. We're lucky if we get 2% organic matter. In the Midwest and on the East Coast, we get a lot higher percentage of organic matter in the soils. And that's because we have a lot more water back there. And here we just don't. So this arid climate lends itself to lower organic matter in our soils. So to get good organic matter, we're gonna constantly be adding compost. We wanna add two to three inches of compost every single year. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about compost as we get into this. We also need access to quality water. Um, so we had secondary water at this site, which is fantastic. We run on Weaver Basin water here. And um, the problem with this site was that I wanted to season extend. I wanted to have high tunnels, but when does the water shut off? It shuts off in October. And so I didn't have access to water at this site year round, only from April to October. So that was an important thing for us and it, it limited our season. So understanding that may change how you do things a little bit. When you plan out your garden, and this garden that you see here is a garden that I had in a backyard in a house that I lived in in Kaysville, and I loved this garden, but it has some great things that we can talk about with planning out the garden. When you plan out your garden, you wanna measure your space first, and then you wanna sketch it out on paper. You can use graph paper, that works really well, and that can help you get things to scale. Um, you gotta think about a few things. You want some of your taller crops, if you're gonna be growing vertically, or if you are planning on you know, having trellises and your rows run east to west, you might wanna put those on the north side so that we don't shade out anything else. If, you're no if your rows run north south, it's not a problem. You can put your tall crops anywhere. Um, so, but that north side is a great place to put those tall crops. So you can see on this, in this picture, in the background, I have a trellis behind this cold frame that's popped up and I had cucumbers in containers and I would run the cucumbers up that trellis and it gave me more space in this very small garden and it didn't shade out anything else. And often the cucumbers would get clear up to the top, you know, and it would give me a really nice green back backdrop, which is kind of a fun thing. You want to place your perennials, so your rhubarb, and if you're growing herbs um, that are perennial or if you were growing asparagus, you want to place those where they won't be disturbed. So in this garden, I have my rhubarb up front, I have all of my perennial herbs up front, and then I have raised beds where I have crops coming and going throughout the season. And you want to plan your crops for spring, summer, and fall. Too often, we only plan for summer. So we could be planting earlier and getting a really nice spring crop of peas or lettuces going. And then we can plant around June or July to get a fall crop going. So I always ask my master gardeners, why don't we plan for a fall crop? And they always go, oh, because we're so tired by then. And it's true. We get tired and we're ready for a break. Um, but fall is one time where we can really utilize the garden where we maybe haven't thought about it before. And then plan for full-size plants. When you sketch out this garden and you plan it out, it's really easy to think about, you know, my tomato seedling is only this big. Well, we've got to remember that that tomato is going to get 
three feet by three feet? Or how are we going to manage that tomato to make it stay smaller in the space so that we can, you know, put more tomatoes in? We have to think about that full size, how we're going to manage it. All of those things are a factor. Hey, Sharon, there's yeah. one quick question about peppers and tomatoes. Uh -huh. And then, so if you'll take a look at that, can you see the Q&A? Oh, hold on. I should probably and then, pop it up so I can. While you're looking at that really quick, there, there's been a question about recording. This is being recorded and it will be posted on our website. So if you want to reference something again, and then the slides will be will be posted. So if you just want to just want to review the slides, that that will be posted as well. So those of you that are panicking or like, oh no, I'm not getting it all. This is available. It'll be posted on our website tomorrow. That's awesome. And I make sure I send the slides to David so he can post those for you because I know there's lots of questions about you, that. You've already sent me the slides, so I'll make yes. sure they're posted. Okay. Um, so Paula wants to know, is it true that peppers like it warmer than tomatoes and should we plant those later than the, the tomatoes? So peppers do like really warm soils, but they can withstand, they're in the same temperature class as the tomatoes. So we don't have to plant them later. We can plant them at the same time. But if you want really good pepper yields, planting them in an area that gets a little more sun is an excellent thing. We want that soil to warm up. So they like warm, sandy, well-draining soil, but they like a decent amount of nutrition too. So we have to add some fertilizers and kind of think about those things. And peppers are tricky. People struggle with peppers. So if you have had a tough time with peppers, I tell people to start with hot peppers. They seem to be a little bit easier to grow. Once you get successful with that, move to sweet peppers and you know make sure you have a good amount of organic matter, soil drains, the soil warms up and they have access to really good sunlight. Okay, so let's kind of flip over to raised beds a little bit because I've alluded to it a bit. Um, and when you're thinking about your site, maybe you want to put in raised beds. So a couple of the reasons why we use raised beds are we may need to modify the soil. So like I said, we have really heavy clay soils or I had somebody call me with a soil test that had um, really high levels of lead and arsenic in their soil. And they were like, what do we do? How do we grow a vegetable garden? Well, we put them in raised beds and we take the contaminated soil out of the picture. Um, so this does improve your drainage. If you have those drainage issues or you just have a soil that doesn't work, um, you don't need to line them with anything. So I get that question a lot. Do I need to put like a plastic liner? Do I need to put a weed barrier? You don't have to. If you do decide to put weed barrier in this, you need to make big slits down the weed barrier so that they can drain really easily. We don't wanna hold water here. Um, it's also pretty easy to amend the soil. So we can make a really nice soil mix. We can add organic matter to it. We can mix it in and it works out really well. Um, they're attractive, they're easy to clean. You can adjust the height to suit your needs. So I have a raised bed in my backyard. I have a little tiny kitchen garden in my backyard and my raised bed is, is waist high. It goes all the way up to my waist and it's completely full of soil. I didn't layer anything in it. I often get that question. You don't have to layer anything in it, but with a bed that high, you definitely can. You can put a false bottom in it halfway down. Um, we just need to make sure that whatever you do, it drains. Um, so if you have a bad back, adjust the height so you don't have to bend over. Um, the cons are this is an added expense. So yeah, we're gonna have to purchase materials and we're gonna have to build these or we're gonna have to pay someone to build them. But I mean, look at how cute they are. I love this hexagon shape. This one is really fun for me. I would love to see um, this implemented in my own garden. Um, do you have to put slits in cardboard weed barrier? Uh, no, you don't have to. Cardboard does break down pretty quickly. And in fact, I lined one of our raised bed areas at the USU Botanical Center with cardboard and it breaks down within a year. If you just have one layer of cardboard, it, it completely breaks down within a year, but it's really good for suppressing that first year of weed growth. Um, and then what kind of wood for raised beds? I get this question a lot. Um, you can use redwood, you can use cedar, I've used pine. Um, the things you want to steer clear from are railroad ties and you don't want pressure treated lumber with chemicals in it because these are edible crops. I mean, if we're going to build a raised bed, we might as well do it right from the very beginning and avoid some of those things that can contaminate our soils. Um, where can you buy compost? You can buy compost at any large um, nursery. 
And, oh, I think Dave is answering that one. So I'm gonna let him finish that one. Oh, whoops. Okay. I, I answered. Thank you. So with our beds, with our raised beds, there are a few things that you kind of need to think about. We don't want the beds to be too wide. If we get really wide beds, how do we reach the middle? We have to step into the bed and that causes compaction. And the whole point of having these raised beds is we have loose, fluffy, well-draining soil. So we don't wanna compact it, that just causes problems. So three to four feet wide is probably your max. You wanna be able to work from the sides and reach all the way into the middle. So if I can't reach the middle from the side, then I have a problem. Um, I was just at someone's home big, beautiful, gorgeous home in East Layton. And they had eight foot wide raised beds and they could never get into the middle of it. And they spent millions on the home and the landscape and everything. And to have these beds that they can't use was just heartbreaking right off the, right the get-go. So make sure you do it right if you're gonna add raised beds. We want the beds, remember I said those plants root in the top six to eight inches. So we wanna be at least eight inches deep. 12 inches is probably ideal, but if you're trying to save cost on wood and lumber, which I know is really high right now, eight inches is, is probably plenty for you. And you'll have enough soil to work with as well. Um, this kind of answers that wood question. We just want a decay resistant material for structure. We don't wanna use that treated lumber or railroad ties and redwood and cedar are really resistant to rot, so they will last a long time. You can use metal as well. I get a lot of questions about metal. You can use it. Um, it just will heat up a little bit more on the edges. So you may have this little zone along the edges where the soil just gets too hot and it burns the plants and, and keeps the plants back from the edge. Um, but they can be any shape, they can be any style. Make it to fit your needs and your space. I see people that also use um, the animal troughs, the big metal animal water troughs, those work great. Just make sure you put drainage in it. And by drainage, a lot of drainage. So you're gonna have to drill holes all over the bottom of that so that it will drain. Or even better, if you can cut out the bottom and just let it free drain, that's excellent. Okay, so no matter if we're planting in raised beds or if we're planting in the ground, we have to prep the soil. This is key. And that's what we did today at the Botanical Center. We prepped soil, everything is weeded, we added organic matter and everything looks great. We're ready for next week. So good soil is built by adding that organic matter and continually building the soil. We want to constantly be adding to it. It's never a one and done. Organic matter breaks down and it dissipates and we need to make sure that we have that available. You, you can soil test, and I highly recommend if you have not done a soil test to do it. Um, you can do it initially to kind of get a feel for what your soil is like. It will tell you your soil texture. So if you have clay soil or sandy soil or a good mix like a loam, that's kind of what we all strive for is to have this really nice loamy soil that holds water but also drains nice. And um, if you have loam, you count yourself lucky. Um, it will tell you your organic matter levels, how much organic matter you have, and will also identify your fertilizer needs. So if you're really high in phosphorus, which a lot of Utah soils already are just naturally very high in phosphorus, then we don't want to go adding phosphorus to the soil because that's just going to make a possible problem into a real problem later. Um, so these kinds of things are key. It should be done before you plant, but I know that the world is not ideal. And if you can't get it done before you plant, then you just do the best you can. So um, you can find out more information and get the soil testing. Um, we have a form that you download. Uh, you can go to our lab, which is USU Analytical Lab, usual.usu.edu. And the website is there and you guys can look up the slide tomorrow and pull up that information. So, but this is a really, really good resource for you. I think it costs $30 to have your soil tested. So it's not bad. And if you have a problem, it helps us identify the problem, we can correct it, and we can test your soil again in one or two years to see how it's doing. But it really helps you kind of understand what's going on. So soil for raised beds, when you go to fill them, I get asked, what do I fill it with? Um, we want a really lightweight soil, but we want it to have enough heft to anchor the plants. It's got to have something to it. And we want it to be able to hold nutrients and to hold water. At the USU Botanical Center, we use a mix. 
Um, there are lots of mixed recipes online that you can find. And there is no one size fits all for this. It's what you prefer, what works in your situation. So you may have to kind of look around, listen to what people are saying, get some feedback. But what we use is we use one part native topsoil. So we often have soil piles over here from projects that we've been doing. So we'll, we'll source from that topsoil and you can pick up topsoil at most of the big garden centers. And then we will add compost. So one part topsoil to one part compost and we mix it half and half together. Um, you can add perlite or vermiculite that to that to lighten it up and to give it a little bit more um, airspace, water holding capacity, better drainage. Um, but we found that this mix works really, really well for us. Um, but to each their own and you can find the mix that works best for you. If you're familiar with the square foot gardening methods, the book by Mel Bar Bartholomew, he talks about a mix that he uses that he loves and that he likes. And so it just kind of depends on your school of thought and where you're at and, and who you want to follow on on soil there. Just remember whatever you add whatever you choose, you're still going to need to amend the soil every single year, which means we're either adding organic matter, we're adding compost, we're adding soil pep, we're adding something to it every year to keep our soil boosted and healthy. I get lots of questions about tilling. There's this whole debate going on right now of till versus no till. And you know what, there are great things about both. Tilling helps to mix nutrients and organic matter down into the soil and then also bring nutrients up from the bottom of the soil. Um, and no-till is great for adding organic matter, um, getting nutrients to percolate down and also not disrupting the soil um, biome and biology that goes on down in the soil. So there are great things on both thoughts. Um, we did a bunch of studies at USU and what we found was that tilling once a year was ideal for nutrition and plant available macronutrients. So those are things like nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. So having those available um, by tilling once a year and mixing those up and bringing them up to the soil level where the plant roots are is a great thing. So we don't wanna to till too often. Once a year is great. Even less might be a little bit better if you could till every other year. Um, one thing is for sure, we don't want to till soil when it's too wet. And I don't think that there's much of a danger of that right now because we've, we've kind of dried out a little bit. But a week ago, I would have told you to wait to till. So how you can tell if your soil is right for tilling, you can see these two pictures here on the bottom. You scoop up some of your soil and you squish it into a ball. And then you open your hand. If it stays in a ball, then it's got a little moisture in it. If it crumbles, it's nice and dry. Um, sometimes it will stay in a ball and if you just barely poke it, it will crumble. So that's okay too. But if it feels sticky, if it feels wet, um, and if you poke it a little bit and it won't crumble, you need to not till. So what happens when we till when we have wet soil is those tines go through the soil and they do what's called glazing and they smear the soil particles because soil comes in these big clumps, these big aggregates, and it smears those aggregates and makes these really hard clumps in the soil. And so we end up with this dirt clod soil that's just awful. And you're like, this is this is the worst. I'm going to till this again. So you come back through and you till it again. And it's usually dried out by them, but we've destroyed the basic soil structure. And we end up with this fine powdery dust. And it takes years and years and years to build the soil back up to aggregates. Um, so we don't want to till when it's too wet. That's that hand squeeze test. Oh, and when we till, it is an excellent time to incorporate organic matter. So if you're trying to get leaf mulch that you saved from last year into the garden, till it in, you know, get it going, prep your beds. Um, with leaf mulch, I tell people the best time to till that in is in the fall. Let it sit over, you know, over winter and start to break down. And then in the spring, your garden is ready to go. You don't have to worry so much about getting that in and letting it break down. It's already plant available. So turning soil in raised beds is a little bit different. We either have to have a really small tiller and we have to have good control and really strong muscles, or we can look at it a different way. We can turn it with a shovel, we can turn it with a fork, um, and those, those ways work really well to incorporate organic matter. Um, we also want to wait until the soil is somewhat dry, but still wet enough to turn. We don't want it to be rock hard and we don't want it to be too dry. So you've got to find that just barely wet kind of situation. And don't turn it too often. Again, once a year is plenty. 
and that will bring up nutrients from low and put them up high where your plants can really get to them. I've talked a little bit about macronutrients and fertilizer. Um, this is what we want to give to our plants, what our plants need, some of the basic ingredients that our plants need to be able to produce. Um, so you'll see when you buy a bag of fertilizer, there's these three numbers on the front of the bag. And they represent nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So this one is nitrogen, the four. 18 is phosphorus, 38 is potassium. So based on soil tests, if I had a soil that was already really high in phosphorus, which often comes high in potassium as well, um, then I would just want a bag that had a number on the nitrogen. I don't wanna add more phosphorus and I don't wanna add more potassium. Phosphorus and potassium stick around in the soil. They don't wash out with water very well. So they're really sticky and they stick to those soil particles. So if you have high phosphorus, it's gonna stick around for a while. So we don't wanna add more. So I would add something like a 2100 instead of this 41838. Nitrogen is responsible for green growth in our plants. So this is going to tell the plant, I want you to grow, I want you to get big, and I want you to produce leaves. Where phosphorus really supports fruit and flower formation. So things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, melons, all of these types of plants really need a decent amount of phosphorus in order to produce that fruit for us. And then potassium supports root growth. Um, potatoes, potassium is important for them, but it also supports, um, potassium also supports whole plant growth. So we need it for the whole plant as well. So like I said, add it based on your soil analysis if you have one. Um, and you're gonna add it at the root zone of the plant. So down around the base of the plant when you plant, I often dig a little deeper when I'm putting in my transplants or my seeds, put in some fertilizer, mix it into the soil with my hand, backfill just a little bit, and then I plant my plant. That way as the roots grow down, they can grow into that zone where that nutrition is available for them. So this, this 14838 is what we would call a complete fertilizer. It has all three macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. An incomplete fertilizer, and you'll hear this a lot, you need an incomplete fertilizer. That means it only has one or two of the nutrients. So you'll see 2100, that's ammonium sulfate, or 4300, that's urea. Um, and those two both only have nitrogen in them and you don't need much. This is one thing that I tell people, you really don't need a lot of fertilizer. So go easy, each plant that you plant. So every time you plant a tomato, you only need a tablespoon or two of fertilizer mixed in around the root zone when you plant. And things like tomatoes don't like to be over fertilized. Um, if we give them too much nitrogen, they will put on a ton of green growth and they won't produce fruit for us. So if you've ever had one of those big bushy tomato plants and no fruit, it may be that we over fertilized with nitrogen. It kind of sent that signal to the plants. So just be careful with the fertilizer and don't over fertilize. I get asked about um, using things like chicken manure, turkey manure. This is the scoop on the poop. Um, it is a good way to add nutrients to the soil, but there's a big but here. And because we're talking about poop, right? Remember that it takes time for this material to break down. So if I go into my chicken coop and I scoop up a bunch of manure and I take it straight out to my garden, there's a couple of things that are gonna happen. It's gonna sit there and it's not gonna be available for the plant. It's not broken down enough. The other thing is that manure is gonna be really hot. And by hot, I mean, it has a lot of salt fertilizers in it, things like phosphorus and potassium in it. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So if you want to add a manure to your garden, add it in the fall so that it can break down over the winter and it will be available by spring. Now I told you I added manure to my gardens this morning. Um, I added steer manure that has been well composted and washed. So it has sat for a while and it has had water run through it. So it's not hot anymore. So animal manure should always be done with soil testing. So if you have a soil that has high phosphorus and high potassium, by adding manures that come from animals like chickens and turkeys, we can be really compounding the problem. So their manures are very, very high in phosphorus and very, very high in potassium. And that is because when they, when they do their droppings, they actually urinate with 
the poop. It's all mixed together in a nice little package for you. And so the urine is what's really hot um, and full of the phosphorus and the potassium. So if you're gonna add something to your soil and you don't want to compound the problem, then if you can source something like llama or sheep or goat manure, you're much better off. They're much lower in phosphorus, much lower in potassium. So, and these are the fertilizers that we call hot, the chicken and the turkey, and that's because of that phosphorus. Also remember that trucking in a bunch of manure, you can create some weed problems. So um, make sure that it has been composted, it has been heated, it has sat for a while. Um, there was a lady that um, I read about, she had a 10 acre organic farm, like serious organic, and she brought in truckloads of manure, not realizing that it would have such horrifying weeds in it. And she created a problem that took her 10 years to fix because she was organic and she couldn't use some of the chemicals um, that she you know, normally would have if she was not organic. So we have a great fact sheet on this very topic on manures. Um, you can look up sustainable manure and compost application and just type USU behind that and this will pop right up for you in your search. Um, but it's a great fact sheet that goes through each of the manures, which ones are better and why. Can you quickly, there's yep. just two questions, one about rabbit and horse manure. I know you've talked about them in general, but maybe just mention yep. a little bit specific. To okay, so rabbit is awesome as far as manure goes. It's probably the best manure out there. Um, it's not high in phosphorus, not high in potassium breaks down nicely. Now these ones that come in these little pellets, these little packages like rabbit and sheep and goat, if you can somehow grind them up or smush them before you add, it's even better because they tend to stay in those little pellets and they don't break down as well. Um, so if you can do that, that's great. Um, horse, was it horse manure? Yeah, it was. Okay, yeah, it was horse manure. Yes, you can use horse. Um, you do need to scoop it out and, you know, hopefully your horse you know, urinates, I, I've had a horse and he would urinate on one side and he would poop on the other. So if you can source that horse manure so that it's, you know, separate from the urine, that's great. If not, then let it sit for a year before you incorporate it and let the snow wash out some of the salts from the phosphorus and the potassium. Okay, move that. Okay, so when we go to plant seed and with our warm season crops like cucumbers and melons, um, some of our squashes, we're gonna put those in by seed. It's very easy to do by seed. We don't need to have starts. So if we were gonna go put those in the ground, um, we have a few rules that we wanna follow. So seeding depth is one of those. And we want to make sure that our seeds are planted at the right depth. So if I take my seed and I sink it way too deep, it's never gonna come up. Um, it will rot before it ever gets out of the ground. So the, the rule is three times deeper than the width of the seed. So if I have a pumpkin seed, they're pretty big. So they're gonna be deeper in the ground, probably like an inch in the ground versus a carrot seed. How big are carrot seeds? They're really small. They're gonna be right on the surface of the ground, maybe a quarter of an inch in the ground, if that. So um, very, very shallow on the carrots. And our seeding dates are gonna vary. I mean, if we were talking about cool season crops like the peas, um, those would go in mid-March through April, which we've kind of missed, but that's okay. You guys can plan for next year, um, or you can plan for fall peas and get those into the garden um, in the end of June, beginning of July. Um, we can also seed our warm season crops, usually mid-May is when we do that. We say along the Wasatch Front that we're going to start putting our crops in, our warm season crops, right around Mother's Day. Sometimes we get soil crusting, and that's where the seeds just have a really hard time pushing up through the top of the soil, like the soil has formed this nice little crust. Adding organic matter is key to fixing this problem. So we've got to add a little bit of organic matter when we till up our garden next spring. There are some seeds that are a little more difficult to get going. Um, they have some slow germination. Onions, beets, and carrots are notorious for being tough to get going. Um, you can't allow the soil to dry or crust. And often you can um, improve your success by soaking your seeds for about 24 hours before you plant them in the ground. So um, this works great with beets, not so well with carrots because they're so small, but you can take your beets, stick them in a jar, throw in a bunch of water, let them sit for 24 hours and then drain it and then go plant. Um, carrots, a lot of people will put a board or carpet over the area that they've planted for a few days. And the key there is a few days and then they'll come back and take that off. And that has 
given the seeds a chance to take up some water and get the germination process going. And then you can't let it dry out. So make sure you stay on top of the watering with that one. Um, planting transplants. This is probably the easiest way to get things into our garden. Um, a couple things that I look for is the plant size. I don't want the plants to be gigantic in this little tiny cell. I kind of want the root area to match the top of the plant. Um, I also want the plants to be a nice dark green color. So if your plants are looking yellowed, really sad, and you're at the nursery, don't buy those ones. Buy the ones that are green and look really healthy. You can look at the roots, and I'm like a ninja when I go into the into the nursery. In fact, I think they kind of run when they see me because I like to pop things out of the little pony packs and just take a little quick look at the roots to make sure that they're, they're not root bound. I want them to have what you see here on the left rather than what we see on the right. The one on the right has been in the container for too long. Um, and we want about 50% of that root ball to look like it has roots on it, not 80 or 90%. And then most things you want it to have, you know, enough leaves so that they can photosynthesize. Sometimes things get started and then they, like, then they get shoved out onto the shelf really fast because the demand is high and you'll end up with plants that have just barely come up out of the ground and that's not a good situation for anyone. So uh, make sure they have a couple of good leaflets on them before you purchase them. When we plant things out into the garden, remember that these plants do not have big extensive root systems. Their root systems are just as big as that little ball is right now. So with our younger plants, we're gonna have to water them frequently. I tell people to check them once they're planted every single day because they can dry out fast and they don't have access to water outside of that root zone. Um, and your frequency of watering is gonna depend on your soil type and it's also gonna depend on the temperature. If we have really hot days, like we're forecast to be in the 80s tomorrow, I'm definitely gonna be checking everything that we've planted to make sure that it has enough water. Um, and then, you know, if you have heavy clay soils, you're going to water less versus sandy soils, you're going to have to water more frequently. With our transplants, I, I get asked how deep to plant those, and the depth will vary with the, with the plant for sure. Plants that develop what we call adventitious roots, so these are things like tomatoes. Tomatoes all along the stem are hairy. Every single one of those little hairs along the stem has the ability to turn into a root. And that's what you see here in this picture in the bottom right. This is a tomato stem that has started to develop what we call adventitious roots. Tomatoes grow in the Mediterranean and they're these huge long vines in their native environment. And to support this great big vine, the plants adapted to wherever those stems were touching the ground, they could put on new roots so that they could take up more water and take up more nutrients. Knowing this, I can plant my tomatoes a little bit dif differently. I can plant them really deep. So a lot of the times I'll tell people, whatever the stem length is, plant halfway up the stem. You're gonna take off the leaves and plant up to halfway up the stem. And then you're gonna develop a nice, um, really, really good and healthy root system along that stem. The other way to do it is to do trench planting. And that's where instead of going deep, we go shallow and sideways. So I'm going to take my tomato, I'm gonna to plant, I'm gonna dig a little trench that's sideways, put the root ball down in and lay the tomato down sideways and just have the top kind of poking up. You're gonna remove all the leaves along the stem. So you're just gonna have the leaves on the top that's poking up and then backfill over that stem and that root ball. What that does is it will form roots much faster that way than if I was to plant it deep because plant development is driven by temperature and light. Now, if we have warmer temperatures on the top layer of the soil versus deep going long down the soil, I'm gonna get root development along that stem much faster because the soil is warmer and that plant is warmer. So um, that's just a little trick to get your tomatoes going faster with bigger root systems. All the other plants that you plant, you're gonna take the root ball, what you see here, it's gonna go down into the hole. We're just gonna barely cover the top with soil. We don't wanna be much deeper than that in, in really any of our other plants because we can smother the plants. But do make sure you put some native soil just along the top because those root balls, if they're not covered, will dry out and you'll get a lot of evaporation or transpiration of water. Okay, things to not transplant. These are things that should be planted by seed. So all of our root crops, carrots, radish, parsnip, beets, turnips, 
and potatoes should not be transplanted. And that's because we can deform the plants that are forming. They form as a root, we're eating the root. And if we disturb that tap root by picking it up out of a pony pack and you know roughing it up, getting it down in the ground, we're gonna definitely disturb it and we're gonna have weird shaped vegetables. And some of us like weird shaped vegetables, some of us don't. So we, you know, those of us who don't wanna eat a weird shaped carrot, just plant those directly in the ground and don't start them in pony packs. We kind of touched on this before, but it's a really important point. point. Um, when to plant outside, your cool season crops can go out anytime when we have daytime air temperatures between around 50 and 70. As soon as you can work the soil in mid-March, mid you can start getting those plants outside. As opposed to those warm season crops, I say 65 here, but 70 is even more ideal. 65 to 90 is our daytime temperature, and that's what we want to see with these plants. And we cannot plant our warm season crops until after the danger of frost is gone. So this time of year, my husband makes fun of me because I am glued to my weather app on my phone, glued. Like I check it 17 times a day to see if it's changing because I'm really interested in those nighttime temperatures. What does the 10 day forecast look like? Can I get my plants out and will they be okay? So I don't wanna see temperatures dropping. I don't wanna see them down into the 40s. I wanna make sure they're 50s or higher at night. That's the biggest part. So like I said, along the Wasatch Front, usually around Mother's Day. We just talked about that. So one thing um, I will mention is sometimes in Utah, we plant our warm season crops at Mother's Day. And then what happens? We end up with a crazy storm towards the end of May and everything freezes. And it's like the whole gardening world just freaks out. Everybody's going crazy. What do I do with my plants? So be prepared all through May to cover your plants if we have a storm or to cover them at night if our temperatures suddenly drop. And by covering, I mean blankets, tarps. Um, I'll take terracotta pots or even plastic pots and invert them so they're over my plants. Um, just be prepared to cover things. I also use painter's plastic. I'm using that right now because my fingers were just itchy and I had to get some stuff in the ground. And so I did plant some things at my house in East Layton and um, it's cold in East Layton at night. It's a little bit colder than other places. So um, I do have painter's plastic that goes over my plants right now every single night. And it acts like a little mini greenhouse over overnight and keeps the cold off of my plants. Remember that once we've planted, we are gonna have to water. We kind of touched on this already, but as your plants grow, this will change too. So your, your water needs are gonna depend on your type of plant. Plants that only produce leaves need a lot less water than plants that produce fruit. Um, your stage of growth, if it's a new seedling plant versus a great big plant that's in the fruiting stage, we're gonna have a lot more water need later on. And our plant size, you know, small patio sized tomato versus great big heirloom tomato, that heirloom tomato is gonna need a lot more water. Just remember, we've gotta think about the available water around the roots, our soil type, clay versus sand, our water use rate, the hotter it gets, the more water plants need. It's how they cool themselves. They bring water up through the plant. They open these little holes in the leaves and they push out water as a vapor and it takes the heat with it. So if the plants don't have water and, and plenty of it, they can't cool themselves in the heat of the summer. And then our irrigation method. Not all of our irrigation methods are created equal. If you have drip irrigation, that's the best. If you're dealing with um, sprinklers, that's a little bit more difficult. It evaporates a little bit faster and we lose a little bit of our water. Um, so just kind of be thinking, is my water efficient? Am I getting enough? Pest and disease management, pests happen, diseases happen. Um, there are ways to deal with both of these things. I'm not gonna go deep into this, but I will tell you that there are methods that you can use that are not chemicals. And that's where I tell people to start. Going out, looking for insects, scouting for them, looking for diseased plants and taking them out early before we have a big problem is probably the best thing that you can do. Visit your garden frequently and really pay attention. So we can take out diseased plants, we can remove insects by hand, we can take um, with squash bugs, we can take um, duct tape wrapped around our hand backwards so the sticky side is out and look for the eggs on the bottom of the leaves and we can 
stick the duct tape to them, remove the eggs, wad it up, and we're done. We don't have the squash bug problems and we can help ourselves before we have to get to a chemical stage. So I'm always assessing if I can take care of a problem you know, with a much more gentle solution. And then when I've decided that it can't be taken care of this way anymore, then we move to a chemical control. And we did this last year. We had um, a horrible year with, with earwigs last year, awful. And um, we took care of them in every way we could think of. And then finally, we just, the pressure was too much. So we had to spray. Um, but you can find out more information about pests and diseases by visiting our pest website. So you can go to extension.usu.edu forward slash pests. We have a vegetable um, IPM, in, um, integrated pest management newsletter that you can sign up for. If we're having problems with vegetables that we see, they will send you a newsletter and say, hey, earwigs are at an all time high. These are your options for taking care of them. You know, these are the chemicals that work. These are the other methods that work. Try all of this and see if it helps you. It, they send you an email maybe once a month, um, but there's one for vegetables, there's one for fruit, there's one for turf, and there's one for landscape plants. And I would strongly advise that you go to the PEST website here and sign up for those different um, emails. Oops. Oh, and you can sign up also at pestadvisories.usu.edu. There's two ways to get there. Weed control is always a problem. There's always weeds. Um, it's the story of my life. We weed, we weed, we weed, and they just come right back. There are some ways that we can take care of the weeds um, that, you know, again, don't involve chemicals. We always try these other methods first. So we can exclude the weeds or we can suppress them with things like mulches. Um, we can do some mechanical control. This is getting out your tools and the elbow grease and going to town and just you can either pull the weeds or you can use a hoe or some kind of um, implement that works well for you. And you know what? I tell people that they need to kind of change their mindset about weeding. Weeding can be really meditative. It connects you to nature. It's time for you to think about things and just kind of relax. You can put on some good music, give yourself a beat and go, go to town on it. Um, we shouldn't look at it as a chore. We should really kind of think about it as an opportunity to do that moment of connecting with nature. And um, I, I really love to weed, but maybe I'm just crazy. <laughs> um, so, but mechanical control, this hoeing, this pulling is best in a home garden. It works really well in a home garden. Your space is not usually so big that you can't control this way. Um, when we look at chemicals in the vegetable garden, I tell people to try not to use them. So the chemicals, I mean, we want, we're gonna be eating this. So we wanna keep it as chemical free as possible, right? Pre-emergence, things like preen in the garden are not great because when we put down a transplant, a little plug, I'm gonna go plant my tomatoes out in my garden, um, pre-emergent will suppress their growth. And so that's not a good thing to do. 2,4-D is a broadleaf weed killer that we usually find um, you know, used in lawns. Sometimes people will use them in their vegetable gardens. It kills things like dandelions and other types of weeds that are not grasses. Um, it can stick around and be active for two to three weeks. So if you do use that, um, you wanna give yourself a good month before you plant in the garden. And then glyphosate is the active ingredient in products like Roundup. And it's pretty much inert when it hits the soil. So it binds to the soil particles and it's no longer active. But I do tell people to give it a good seven to 10 days after using Roundup in the garden before they go planting. Um, 2,4-D also should not be used when it's above 85 degrees. So it can drift and move, um, it volatilizes, it becomes a vapor and it will kill a bunch of things in your garden. So um, even if you have lawn near your garden, make sure that you're not using 2,4-D when it's too hot or when the wind is blowing because you can still cause problems in your vegetable garden. Okay, I kind of wanted to go through some of the crops and Faridin, the families. Be yes. Before you move on to crop families, there was one question that I thought you could answer okay. um, that's in there about um, potatoes and a problem. Okay, so um, in my raised bed garden, I get a lot of holes in my potatoes every year. It looks like either an insect has burrowed in the plant or that it is rotted in these small quarter inch holes. Any ideas as to what is happening? Yeah, you probably have wireworms. Um, wireworms are really common in potatoes. Um, and other root crops. And um, 
they, they can be a little bit difficult to treat. If you will look up USU wireworms, I believe we have a great fact sheet on it that will help you get through that. So um, there, there are some things you can do to help yourself. And they, they do feed on a lot of organic matter. So reducing moisture and reducing organic matter might help a little bit. And Joan, I did not mention squirrels. Um, squirrels are tricky. They're difficult to take care of. Um, you may have to trap them and either relocate them or I hate to say get rid of them in another way, but um, they can be really hard. Uh, you can also put wire baskets over your, your little starts as they grow and hopefully they can get big enough that the squirrel damage won't be so bad. Um, you can deter them that way as well. Okay, so let's dive into the crop families because this is where it gets fun. This is where you know you kind of get to dream about what you want to plant. Um, so we can group all of these crops into a couple of families and um, it kind of helps us understand their growth cycles a little bit. And it can also help us rotate crops. So if we're going to be doing some crop rotation in our garden, which is important to keep disease and insects down, we don't want to be planting our potatoes in the same spot every year because we end up with problems. So we want to make sure we move them. So we've got our first group is salad crops. These are all the cool season salad crops. We've got lettuce, cabbage, chard, kale, all those leafy kinds of greens. And then we have the salad toppers. So we've got carrots and radishes, peas, that kind of, that kind of thing. Peas can also be grouped into the legume group. We've got fruiting crops. So these are the things, these are those rock stars of the garden again. These are things that produce fruits. We've got the um, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplants, melons, cucumbers, squashes, summer squash and winter squash all fit into this category because they produce this fruit for us. We've got the legumes, so you know you can group the peas and the legumes as well. Um, so beans and peas, they fix nitrogen in the soil, so they have this relationship with a fungal, um, a fungus in the soil that they um, create almost like a little house. So the fungus comes up next to the root and kind of like knocks on the door and says, hey, I'm here. And the root says, okay, and it creates this little circle around this mycorrhizae type fungus. And as it creates the circle around it and gives it a protected place to live, it also increases the water absorption because it increases the surface area of the root, the little mycorrhizae does, the little fungus. And it um, supplies the roots with nitrogen. In exchange, the plant gives it a house and also um, gives it some carbohydrates because fungus cannot create its own carbohydrates. So it feeds it for water and nitrogen. So peas and beans both do this and they create um, nitrogen in the soil that way. And then we have grass crops. These are things like corn, grains. If you've ever grown any of those um, grain type crops, some people do, um, they fit here. So if I was to look at a crop rotation schedule, I would group everything into one of these four groups and then I would rotate these four groups through the garden in a different spot every single year. Just, you know, wherever my salad was last year, my fruiting crops will be there this year. And then next year, my legume crops will be there. And the year after, my corn will be there. So let's look at some of these salad crops. Um, they're cool season. Um, if you haven't got them in yet, that's okay. You can plant them for fall or you can wait until next spring. Hot weather can be a problem with them. It can change the flavor. It creates some, some bitter compounds and they'll bolt, which means they send up a flower stalk. And once they do that, they just don't taste very good at that point. There's shallow seeded, so we put them kind of very close to the surface. Their seeds are very small. If we're gonna transplant them, we wanna see about four to six leaves on our little transplants before we put them out. And they are very shallow rooted. They cannot handle water stress. Um, you can harvest these types of crops anytime. You don't have to wait for the full head of lettuce to form. You can take off the individual leaves on the outside and it will continue to push leaves outward as it grows. Here's some examples of some of these salad crops. You've got the butter lettuces, the mixes, speckled lettuces. If you've never grown a romaine lettuce, it's kind of fun. They're really upright and tall. There's a red oak leaf lettuce, and there's a bunch of different really cool heirloom types of lettuce. And by heirloom, I mean those plants have been around for 50 years or longer. They're usually very genetically stable. They're open pollinated, which means they're wind pollinated or insect pollinated. We don't control the pollination on these plants. When we look at the salad toppers, these are things like our cauliflower, broccoli, radishes, cabbage, and carrots. Again, these are cool seasons, so they like those cooler temperatures shallow seeded, they have very small seeds, 
And there's a few of them that are better to transplant. Things like cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower do best when we get them going as transplants or we pick up transplants from the nursery. And they just can't handle water stress either. Most of them are shallow rooted with the exception of things like carrots. We harvest when the head size is full or when the root has sized. And here are some of our examples. I mean, if this doesn't make you just want to plant a garden, I don't know what will. These colors just make me so happy. But we've got radishes. There are so many varieties of radishes. Beets, um, some of my favorites are the Detroit dark red. That is a standard beet. It is beautiful. It is so dark red. You see it here on the, the left hand side. We've got golden beets. If you've never planted a bullseye beet, that's kind of fun, especially if you're trying to get your kids to eat beets because um, they look like bullseye. So that's a chiogia. Um, and then we've got you know, our standard white beet. There are other types that come with purple leaves and the leaves and the roots are edible on this. Really, really good. Um, a bunch of different types of carrots. These little round ones, if you have clay soils, these Parisian carrots are really, really good for you to grow because they don't require that soft loamy soil to make a long tap root. So you can still grow carrots. You're just gonna have the little round ball type carrots. There's a lot of different broccolis that you can grow. I've had really good luck growing, excuse me, growing gypsy broccoli. It is a hybrid and it does extremely well. We get great big heads on our broccoli. Cauliflower, I mean, you can get um, self-blanching varieties. So by self-blanching, I mean that the leaves kind of close over the head and they keep the head nice and white. If you don't have a self-blanching variety, you've got to pull the leaves over the head and you've got to tie it up to keep it from getting sun scalded because it won't taste good if you do that. So um, look for different varieties. There's one called Skywalker that is self-blanching that's really good. Onions and garlic, this kind of fits into this category. They're cool season. Um, we get really good growth up to about 90 degrees and they just don't like to be in the heat. Onions are shallow seeded and planted um, in the spring. Garlic is planted in the fall and we plant the individual cloves of garlic about three inches deep five to nine inches apart. And um, we mulch it in really well. We put a good amount of, I usually put about six inches of straw on top of it after I backfill the soil. That helps keep it really insulated over the winter. And what happens with the garlic is it puts on root growth and over the winter and then in the spring, it will put up um, the nice green leafy growth. We transplant onions out at six to eight leaves. Onions are really shallow rooted. They cannot handle drought stress and they cannot handle weed pressure. So if you've tried onions and they haven't worked for you, it may be that you didn't water enough or that you let it get a little weedy. The garlic will harvest when the bottom couple leaves start to turn yellow and wilty. Um, and the onions will harvest when the tops start to fall over and the bulbs are sized. And I found that both types of onions store really well, but seed onions tend to do better than sets. So sets are these little, I have some right here. I'll show you. Sets come like, like this. So you can buy a big bundle of onions. They look all dried out and they don't look alive, but once you put them in the ground, they just kind of spring to life. Um, but it's a great way to cheat and get really good onions. So garlic, there's a bunch of different varieties. You can grow shallots. Um, some of the onion varieties I've had a really good successful crop with are things like Patterson and Candy. Both of those have been excellent for me. You can grow the bunch onions as well. I love this, um, this red Welsh. That one's a really great onion. Okay, these are the ones that everyone wants to grow. These are the tomatoes, the peppers, the eggplants. They're warm season, so they're gonna go out in the garden in a few weeks, a week or two actually. They don't like temperatures below 50 degrees. We can do by seeds or transplants. Sometimes we'll get a split set when it's over 95 degrees. Um, we won't be able to set the pollen in the plant. So you'll have a crop that's forming and then we'll have this blank space where there's no crop that formed while the temperature was really hot. And then once the temperature comes back down, the plant will start to set fruit again. We don't wanna give these guys a lot of fertilizer. They will sacrifice fruit growth for vegetative growth, for leafy growth. So once you start to see flower clusters, don't fertilize. And we, har we can harvest when they're green or we can harvest when they're fully mature and ripe. And they're really sensitive to irregular watering. So we'll get cracked shoulders. Um, blossom end rot is a problem with tomatoes and it, people always say it's a calcium problem. Well, yes, but it's really a water problem. If you correct the watering on these plants and give them nice even soil moisture, 
So if you were to look at the moisture of the soil on a graph, it wouldn't go like this, wet, dry, wet, dry. It would be, you know, maybe a little wet, maybe just a little bit more dry. It would be really even. And that will fix the problem with blossom end rot. This is what blossom end rot looks like. You can also use a foliar calcium spray. Don't put calcium in the soil. Don't add eggshells to the soil. We have a ton of calcium in our soil already. So if we will just put calcium on the leaves and you can pick up a foliar spray at IFA, at some of the larger home centers, at the nurseries, and you just spray the plant, it puts the calcium in the plant so that the plant doesn't have to move it with water. And the problem with the watering is the calcium molecules in the soil are so big, it's hard for the plant to move the calcium up if it doesn't have even watering. So even watering usually fixes the problem. Determinant tomatoes, well, they're like your paste tomatoes. They set one crop and they're done. They don't set any more tomatoes after that. Indeterminate continue to bear. They're the long vining types. These are the ones that we usually grow. Um, here's some of the options for you for hybrids and heirloom type tomatoes. So hybrids are genetically selected. They're not genetically modified. They're genetically selected for characteristics and we will breed one parent with another parent to get this cross that we like. If I was to plant the seeds from the cross, it won't come back to that same plant. It will revert to one of the parents. So they're not genetically stable. Where hybrids are genetically stable, and we, if we were to take the seeds from the hybrid, we're going to get the same plant again and again and again. Okay, um, but here's some of the different varieties that that you may want to try. Some of my favorites, um, I'm, I'm an heirloom junkie, so I, I grow a lot of the heirlooms, but green zebra, um, pink German is huge. If you want a great big, beautiful tomato, that one's awesome. We talked a little bit about potatoes. They don't like very cold weather, but they can be planted around April 15th. What you do is you get large seed potatoes and you cut them so that you have two, at least two eyes on each piece. You let them dry overnight and then you can plant them in the soil. They like nice uniform watering, just like a tomato. They're in that same family. And then you can heal the plant. So as the plants start to come up through the ground, you're just gonna keep covering them with soil um, until you have a nice mound of dirt. And that's gonna give you more root area to form more tubers. And then we have the vining crops, things like squash, melons, cucumbers. These are warm season. Um, they like to be a little bit drought stressed before you harvest. That will give you a little bit of flavor. So pull back on the water just a little bit. And hot weather can cause bitter cucumbers. I always get asked when melons are ripe. The first thing you look for is the background color. We want to have a nice green color. Or if we're dealing with a cantaloupe, we want to see underneath that netting, it turns that orange color. When we turn over the melon, we should have a really nice creamy colored ground spot. And when you look at the vine coming off the melon, there should be a little curly cue. It's the first tendril, that first curly cue should be nice and dry. So those are the ways that you find a good melon. There's a bunch of different varieties that you can look up and look at the slide tomorrow. We're running out of time here, I'm sorry. So I'm gonna kind of skip through this just a little bit. You guys can look at all of these wonderful varieties tomorrow. Peas and beans. Of course, peas are cool season, beans are warm season. You can soak the seeds before planting. It will give you a little bit more um, success with germination. There are bush and vine types. So if you don't want to have to trellis things, look for bush types. There are bush type peas and bush type um, beans, both. And we have to have a good amount of water when they start to flower or they will not form fruit. Like I said, they fix their own nitrogen, which is a great thing, really good for crop rotation. And then we have corn. Um, it's warm season, so we're going to be putting that out in the next week or two. You can do it by seed. You can also do it by transplant. I've had great luck both ways. Um, for pollination, it's really important that we plant in a square. Um, if we just plant one single row of corn, you're not going to get good pollination because it's wind pollinated. That pollen has to blow um, back and forth between the, the plants. So if you'll plant in a big square, you'll get much better um, ears that form. Uh, and water is really critical at pollination. They've got to have enough water to transfer pollen and move pollen through that plant. Each silk is attached to a kernel of corn. So if you've opened up one of your, your ears and there's only a couple kernels that have formed, you didn't get good pollination because we didn't get that silk to pollinate and go down to each kernel. 
Um, it is a really high nitrogen user, so you do need to fertilize pretty heavily. And once you see those um, silks form, you know that you have between 15 and 25 days until those ears are mature and ready to pick. So it just depends on the variety. And if you have less sweet corn, it may be that you had some cross-pollination with a neighbor's corn that isn't as sweet as yours. So that is definitely a possibility. Asparagus is a wonderful perennial crop. Um, you can plant this really early. It comes in bare root crowns. And you're gonna plant it early. You dig an eight inch deep trench. You put in your crowns and you only backfill it by two inches. So it's gonna look weird. You're gonna have this big pit where your asparagus goes. Once you see the asparagus start to come up, you add another two inches and then you wait again. And once it comes up, you add another two inches and you repeat this process till you're back to level ground. Um, if you do the eight inches and then fill in the eight inches, you smother them and they just can't survive, but they do need to be planted really, really deep. They don't like to be super wet, but they do like to have a little bit of moisture. Um, and you can fertilize after you harvest and you have to let these plants fern. So you're gonna harvest for a while and then you're gonna let some of the asparagus grow and fern out. And that's gonna give you um, photosynthesis and put energy back into the roots for next year. And you can harvest longer the more established your stand is. So you can kind of see this harvest schedule here. Okay, last plant, rhubarb. We already talked about this being an ancient plant. It takes one or two years to get going. And once it's going, then you can really start to, do, to um, harvest it nicely. Um, and you can divide it about every five years and share with a neighbor or a friend. They don't like to be super wet, but they do need a decent amount of moisture. This is a good size plant um, and the leaves are very large. And if they don't have enough moisture, they will show it on the leaves. You fertilize it after you harvest. The leaves can be poisonous. So if you have little kids or dogs that like to munch on your plants, you might wanna skip the rhubarb. And then you can harvest about a third of the plant each year. So you don't wanna over harvest, um, but just keep that in mind, only about a third. So I know we have a bunch of questions and I know we're over on time, I'm sorry, but I'll take all the time you need to answer questions. Okay, are there some things that work better together like companion plants? Yeah, I mean, you can definitely companion plant. Um, it's not necessary. There, there's not gonna be one thing that really boosts the health of another. Um, but a lot of the times what we do with companion planting is we try to bring in pollinators into the garden. So we will plant things that flower. So we'll plant flowering herbs like lavender, sages, and those will bring in pollinators and also beneficial insects that will, number one, hunt other insects and number two, pollinate your crops really well. So when we think about companion planting, that's probably the best thing to think about for that. And are there things that need to be planted that should not be planted together to avoid cross-pollination? Yeah, so if you're trying to save seeds from anything in the squash and cucumber and melon group, um, you have to plant those about two miles apart. Bees travel and they will move pollen and it's almost impossible. It's best to not save seed from those plants. Now, if you have melons and cucumbers and squash planted together this year, it will not affect the fruit this year. It will only affect the seeds on the plants next year. So not really an issue. The only thing that we see a problem with with cross-pollination on the food that we eat this year is corn. And that's when we have maybe a less sweet variety planted next to a super sweet variety. And then the super sweet variety ends up not being super sweet. How do you control aphids in broccoli and cauliflower? That is a tough one. They really like the brassicas. So insecticidal soap is a really good place for you to start. Um, and you can even knock the aphids off with a heavy stream of water, but they will crawl back up the plant. So you have to do that every day. But insecticidal soap dries out the aphids really quickly. So insects have what's called a cuticle around them. It's kind of this waxy hardened coating. The aphids, aphids are a little bit softer bodied. So if you use something really simple like that insecticidal soap, which you can pick up at like, any nursery, I think Home Depot has it and Lowe's has it. Um, it's really mild, it's a detergent and it dries out the cuticle and dries out the outside of the aphid and kills them pretty quickly. Some of the best cucumber vari varieties. So Paula, my husband's favorite cucumber is a lemon cucumber. He absolutely loves lemon cucumbers and it's a round, very light yellow colored one. Um, I like the Japanese cucumbers. We're growing Armenians this year. Um, I'm growing a new one called an apple cucumber this year. So there are so many varieties. You have to find what you love. 
Um, but I, I really do like those Japanese ones because they're long, they're skinny, and they're really crunchy. So how do I feel about sub-irrigation for tomato plants? Sub-irrigation. So underneath, you might have to clarify this for me a little bit, underneath the soil, or are you meaning drip irrigation? So please clarify that for me, and I'll answer this next one. Um, do you know what little tiny worms making round holes in pear leaves at this time of year may be and how to get rid of them? So Natalie, if you are in Davis County or Weber County, we have a USU extension office in those counties and you can bring in a sample to the offices or you can send in an email with photos. That might really help us. Um, there shouldn't be any worms out making holes in pear leaves at this time of year. So we might have to have some pictures and some more information. So look up your local USU extension office. I know that if you're in Davis County, we have a, a, an open diagnostic clinic on Tuesdays and Thursdays from nine to noon and you can drop by the office and you can um, get some answers there. If you're in Weber County, I'm not sure when their office is running diagnostics, but you could call. Okay. We have tomato and pepper starts that are starting to get blossoms. Do we need to pull those off? Yes, if they are not planted yet, then yes, you do, because we want them to determine or to establish a really nice root system. And that root system will not establish because we've got um, reproductive structures going on. So the plant kind of has to choose. Do I want to reproduce or do I want to have roots? And it's going to choose to reproduce every single time. So take those off, get them planted, and um, your plants will, will be able to establish a nice root system. Okay, underneath the soil in raised beds on the sub irrigation for tomato plants. So we've run irrigation underneath the soil before at the botanical center and we have not had the best luck with it. So what happened was um, the lines actually ended up clogging over time. So if you're not gonna dig it up and replace lines every so often, um, you may run into the same problem that we ran into. We actually just ripped it out. It was over at our Utah house um, gardens. And um, it had been there about 10 years when we had some serious problems with it. So we ripped that up, completely removed it, and we irrigate in a different way. So, you know, there's sixes to every kind of irrigation out there. So that's, that's a potential problem for you. But if it works well for you and you've been running it for a while, then, you know, continue to do it for a while to you know, see how it works for you. If you use brick pavers in your raised gardens, is there a section where it gets too hot or are there problems with using these? No, there's not problems with using these. It will radiate out some heat and it will keep things warmer at night, which is great in the spring and in the fall. Um, not so great in the summer, but if you go out with a, you know, and water in the evening and you just happen to get those brick pavers a little bit wet when you water, um, that might really help cool them off for the, for the evening. Would straw make good mulch for water retention in a raised bed? Yes, and we use straw for a mulch all the time here at the USU Botanical Center. If you have not been over here to see our vegetable gardens, you should come. We have two. We have the edible demonstration garden and we have the urban farm demonstration garden. Um, both do vegetables in a very different way um, and we use straw in the, the urban farm demonstration garden. Um, that one kind of shows you how to flip your backyard into production. So if you were going to feed your family, how are you going to do it? So we show you how to plant a lot in a really small space. It's an eighth of an acre and we typically pull out about 3,000 pounds of vegetables in our vegetable area, which is about 2,000 square feet. So it's a massive amount of food coming out of a very small space. Um, but we do use straw mulch to retain water in that area and it works great. Um, if you have a tall raised bed, what do you recommend filling it with? So mine is filled with um, just a regular mix of topsoil and compost. Um, some people with a very tall raised bed will put in like giant logs in the bottom to kind of fill some of the space because it is expensive to fill it, um, especially space that big. Um, I've seen other people take and do a false bottom. So they'll go halfway up and they'll, they'll screw in a false bottom with a bunch of drainage holes all over it so that they don't have to fill it up quite so high. Um, I did mine full soil so that I could get worms coming up so that I could get good drainage so that I could get, you know, the soil washing down into the soil beneath it because I have, um, in front of it, I have perennial herbs all planted. And so as I water, nutrients kind of wash down 
into where the perennial herbs are. So you can fill it with, you know, there's some options there for you, but, um, you know, I would definitely recommend doing at least 12 inches of really good soil. Is there any effective way to deal with morning glory? Oh, yeah, this is a tough question. So morning glory is also called field bindweed. It is the devil. I think the devil honestly sent it. Um, so it literally goes through the center of the earth. It's this weed that puts on deep, deep roots. They found the roots like 10, 15 feet down into the ground. And every time you break it off, it forms a new plant. So don't till that. Um, you can solarize it. So you can take and put clear plastic over it, heat it up in the heat of the summer that way. And that will, um, that will push it back a little bit. Um, it's one of those that you have to do a little bit of chemical control on, you know, honestly. Um, I will take and use a hoe on it all year long if I have it. And it will, you know, just cutting the tops off over and over again will wear out the plant, reduce the resources that it has, because it's going to take, it's going to photosynthesize, it's going to move carbohydrates down into the root zone, and those carbohydrates are going to be used for next year's growth. So if I can reduce the amount of photosynthesis by cutting the top off once a week all the time, then that's really going to set the plant back. And then in the fall, when we have co cooler temperatures, usually a nice light frost, I will go out with a mix of 2,4-D, a broadleaf weed killer, and glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. And I will spray it because the cuticle, that waxy covering on the leaves, has broken down a little bit in the frost. And um, it will take up the, the chemical really nicely. Plus, in the fall time, it's really working on pushing all of its energy and nutrition down into the roots. So it will take that chemical right down into the roots and really set the plant back. But it's one you have to stay on top of. And Kim also says, yes, on Japanese and Armenian cukes are both super prolific and don't bitter easily. So there you go. Japanese and Armenians are great for, for cucumbers. Can I plant tomatoes with potatoes? Yes, you can plant them in the same area. Just remember they're in the same family. They get the same diseases. So remember we had those four kind of groups. Um, they're in that fruiting, that fruiting group and they will get the same kind of diseases. So make sure you rotate them to a different place the next year. Don't put the tomatoes where the potatoes were and don't put the potatoes where the tomatoes were. So just make sure you, you rotate. I used straw to cover my veggies, but then a bunch of green stalks started to grow and it was supposed to be weed free. It's never weed free. That's the lesson right there. Not sure if that's normal. What kind of straw do you suggest? We just honestly use leftover straw from our events like baby animal days, things like that. And yeah, you get a little bit of, um, weed that comes up every now and then. It's usually pretty easy. If you have ever seen a scuffle hoe or a hula hoe, it's usually pretty easy to knock it back with that. And, um, you know, it doesn't take much time. And they're usually not rooted deeply because we've got a really nice layer of straw mulch that, you know, they're really easy to rip out. So I don't worry about that too much. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something you're going to have to deal with if you're going to use straw. Um, Jerry says, if you add straw mulch, when should it be added right after planting or later? We do it right after we plant, um, but you can add it anytime. Um, so we'll plant and once the plants are in, we'll add the straw mulch and then we'll, we'll flip on the water and get things going that way. Um, but yeah, that's when we add it. Okay, my kids surprised me by rebuilding my rotting redwood raised beds with pressurized lumber. Is there anything I can do to still use them? Still use them, it's okay. Um, just remember that you may have a zone around the edge of the, of the bed where you have some chemical contamination. So you might want to put flowers around the edge of the bed if you can, and then put your vegetables in the middle. So still use them. It's okay. Don't freak out. Don't worry about it. It will be okay. All right. I think we've got the questions done, Dave. There, there may be one more. Um, Shari had raised her hand. She may have joined oh. late and didn't hear. So Shari, if you're wanting to ask a question, if you'll please type it into the Q&A box, then we'll get that answered right, right, right now for you. Okay, I'm sorry we went over guys, but it's such oh, a no, it's big good. topic. It's hard, to, <laughs> it's hard to do it in an hour and answer questions, but I hope you guys learned something, so. I don't think anybody's complaining. And okay. it's, <laughs> it's the time of year and this is so fun and we're all anxious to get going, right, in our yeah. gardens. And it's my favorite topic to teach, so I tend to talk a lot, I'm sorry, but yeah. Okay, oh, Me thanks too. guys. 
Oh, okay. I guess Shari maybe has her question answered. So okay. I think we're good. I really appreciate you, Sheridan, taking time and your knowledge and your expertise here. And it's been fantastic. So thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thanks for joining me tonight on this beautiful day. I know you'd probably rather be in your garden. So. <laughs> and there's still time, but there's yeah. still a little bit of light. You can actually get out and start working if you want. Absolutely. And yeah. So just one other thing for anybody still on our, our learning garden in Layton is also open and things are, you know, things are really kind of taking off. So if you're looking for places to visit, you know, gardens and get ideas for landscapes and all that stuff, the Kaysville Botanical Centers are great. The Ogden Botanical Center, our garden, come and visit these places. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to see things growing and you'll, you'll just gain extra knowledge just by visiting these locations and just seeing how we do it. So appreciate it. Everybody have a good night. Thanks, guys. Bye. Hey, bye.